Good evening, and welcome to tonight's virtual town hall meeting. Thank you for joining us. I'm Springfield City Councilor Jesse Letterman. Since my election as an at-large counselor in 2017, I've hosted more traditional town hall style meetings in neighborhoods across the city of Springfield in an effort to make local government more accessible and transparent. These events have engaged hundreds of residents in the local process and provided a valuable opportunity for me and my colleagues to hear the concerns of our neighbors and constituents so that we might better serve you while also sharing information on our work in local government. Since right now, the best way to keep our neighbors safe is for as many as possible to stay home, I wanted to provide an opportunity to bring the same experience to our community virtually. And that's what leads us here tonight for this live panel discussion and question and answer session with some of our city's top officials and hardworking essential community organizations that are providing important resources during this difficult time. I wanna start by thanking our partners in this event, Focus Springfield Community TV, especially engineer Brendan Holland for assisting with broadcasting and engineering tonight's program. I also wanna thank our Spanish language interpreters, Jacqueline Lozada and Lena Enton for volunteering to ensure that our program is accessible to as many community members as possible. And also a thank you to our live captioner. Let me begin by saying that the COVID-19 pandemic represents one of the most challenging public health and safety crises of our time. Undoubtedly, the impact of this coronavirus has already had serious and lasting effects on our community, our economy, and our families. Here in Springfield, we know that many of our neighbors are facing financial hardship due to layoffs and reduced hours. Our kids are out of school, many of our businesses have been forced to close temporarily, and families and community traditions have been postponed or canceled. While the steps being taken to stop the spread of COVID-19 and flatten the curve are necessary, I know that these precautions are not easy for our community. While we must continue to practice physical and social distancing, let us also keep our family, friends, and neighbors close in our hearts. We may be physically apart, but we must be united and together in our response to get through this. Many in our community have already stepped up in this spirit. We have seen individuals and businesses coming forward to donate personal protective equipment, meals, and other needed resources to those on the front lines of this pandemic. We've seen organizations and individuals step up to support those who have been financially impacted. There is no doubt that Springfield remains strong and resilient during these challenging times. I also wanna say thank you to the essential workers who continue to serve our community. The doctors, nurses, personal care attendants, EMTs, and other hospital staff who are keeping our healthcare system running and treating those who are in need. To our police officers and firefighters who continue to work around the clock to keep us safe. Our National Guard who has deployed to assist with emergency response. Our grocery store workers and distributors who keep the supply chain operating and who are in desperate need of personal protective equipment. Our postal workers, emergency childcare providers, bus drivers, DPW employees, restaurant workers and operators, and delivery personnel, and all those who must continue to go to work every day. You are the heroes of this time, and we are grateful to you. While we continue to mobilize the response to COVID-19, we mourn the loss of the members of our community who have passed away due to this virus. And we keep those who are fighting to recover from the virus in our thoughts and prayers. I'm about to introduce our panel for the evening, but first allow me to provide an update on the activities of the city council in the wake of this pandemic. City councilors, including myself, have remained in close communication with local state and public health officials. We are participating in weekly video meetings with the mayor's administration to be briefed on the municipal response and to provide input based on our communications with constituents. I'm also staying in close contact with different community organizations to gain additional insight into the needed resources in the community and have had the opportunity to participate in conversations 
with local elected officials statewide and nationwide to discuss best practices during this time and track what other communities are doing. We are continuing to provide constituent services via phone and email and working to get information provided by the state and federal government out to our constituents. On my website, I've set up a specific page for updates on the COVID-19 response and resources available to the community. We've also broken down information on some of the key aspects of the Federal CARES Act as they relate to Springfield. The City Council is now meeting remotely to continue the business of the city. Last week, we accepted and authorized over $2 million in federal funding for coronavirus response. We've also begun discussing the financial impact of COVID-19 on the city budget and how we will pursue reimbursements from the state and federal government to ensure Springfield's taxpayers do not alone bear the brunt of the needed emergency spending. Our remote meetings are still able to be accessed via Focus Springfield for constituents to watch live and review later. Essential city services continue to function, including trash and recycling pickup and the 311 call center. The city has delayed collection of the trash fee until May 11th, and also delayed until May 11th the application of demand notices to excise tax bills. As authorized by state legislation, the city has postponed the due date for real estate taxes to June 1st. At the outset of the pandemic, I authored a letter signed by the majority of the city council advocating for needed financial relief to individuals and businesses who have been impacted by COVID-19 including pushing for fair and reasonable accommodations for renters, homeowners, and businesses who are financially impacted through a moratorium on foreclosures and evictions, as well as direct cash stimulus payments and a pause on negative credit reporting to allow financially impacted individuals and businesses to recover. As a part of that call, we also urged expanded resources to support homeless individuals who are especially vulnerable to COVID-19. And city councilors continue to work together to support state legislation with those goals in mind. During this time, our methods of communication and action may have changed, but our advocacy and service has not. I and other counselors remain available to provide constituent services, and we encourage individuals to reach out to us directly, whether by phone or email, or to contact the city at 311. It remains an honor and a privilege to serve our city of Springfield. And through our collective efforts, I know we will get through this together. And that brings us to our panel discussion for this evening. We are extremely lucky to have some of the top officials in the city of Springfield and wonderful individuals who run some incredible community organizations with us here today to answer questions and talk a little bit about the work that they are doing to respond to COVID-19 in our community. Our first guest, and we appreciate her presence so much because we understand how busy, of course, she is, is Commissioner Helen Colton Harris, the Commissioner of Health and Human Services for the City of Springfield. Commissioner, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Commissioner, um, can you share a little bit with those who might be watching about what the role of the Health Commissioner and the Department of HHS is during this type of pandemic emergency? Yes, and first of all, let me thank you. I think this is an important discussion and I'm very happy to participate. I'm um, so pleased that you've decided to um, use the, this platform in order to engage our residents. So let me start by thanking you and the members of the City Council. The Department of Health and Human Services is the public health entity for the City of Springfield. We are the Board of Health. The Board of Health gets all infectious diseases uh, for the city of Springfield. So our role during this uh, very difficult uh, pandemic for many of our residents is to get the infectious disease reports on COVID-19, to manage those, to be in touch with our residents and their contacts, to make sure that they are doing the mitigation efforts that need to happen in order to try and keep those individuals healthy. Thank you so much for that overview and that explanation. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, what that process looks like and how we're coordinating with the local medical community to track the progress of the pandemic? 
Certainly, thank you. That's a great question. Um, the State Department of Public Health has a system called MAVEN. MAVEN is the portal where, again, all of the infectious diseases are put into, and we get that report on a daily basis. So on a daily basis, I know how many individuals in the city of Springfield are COVID-19 positive. We take that data or that information and it is given to one of our nurses. Right now, we are fortunate because we not only have the nurses at the Springfield Department of Health and Human Services, but we have public school nurses who are joining us in order to do what's called contact tracing. Not only do we need to be in touch with those individuals who are COVID-19 positive, but we also need to contact those individuals that they came in contact with. And you might know that that's a really big task. Right now in the city of Springfield, as of today, there are 601 individuals who we have identified as COVID-19 positive and another 600 individuals who they list as their contacts at this point. Commissioner, uh, could you just repeat uh, those numbers, the numbers of positive cases in the city you said? 601 as of today. I put today's numbers up, which were 33, and that brought the total, I'm sorry, it was 38. That brought the total to 601. That number will be up on the city's website tomorrow. Thank you so much. And these are questions um, that are a combination of questions that were submitted, as well as questions that I've received uh, throughout uh, the time that this pandemic received. Uh, and I know this is important information you're able to provide to us. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what someone should do if they think that they are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and what those symptoms might look like? So let's talk a little bit about the symptoms because what we found out about this virus is that symptoms are different oftentimes in um, different individuals. But let me talk about the symptoms um, that we know. We know that a fever, uh, sustained fever is a symptom. We know a cough is a symptom. Body aches um, are a symptom. And so those are some of the prevalence, uh, but we've also heard individuals talk to us about chills, talk to us about other symptoms that they're having. And we also have individuals who are asymptomatic, who show no symptoms at all, but yet test positive for COVID-19. And, and the asymptomatic individuals, this must make, you know, complying with the stay at home advisory is especially important. So you can be, uh, you may be positive for COVID-19, but be showing no symptoms. Absolutely. And that is what we call community spread. If you remember early on in the epidemic or the pandemic, we were checking individuals who were coming from certain uh, countries because we thought that that was a way that we could mitigate uh, the virus in the United States of America. Well, that didn't happen. And so what we know is community spread is pervasive. Individuals who aren't showing symptoms, but yet have the droplets um, and are able to spread those. So we have community spread and individuals are asymptomatic at that time. We've gotten a lot of questions, um, both for the town hall, but also I know you've received these questions and counselors have received these questions about the status of testing. Can you talk a little bit about right now um, who is eligible to be tested? Right now, testing is done consistently for first responders. And so first responders have access. Testing is being done for individuals who are symptomatic. Uh, so those individuals are able to get tested. We do not have widespread testing at this point, which is problematic. It's problematic because if we had the testing available that was necessary, we could rule individuals in or rule individuals out and not wait for them to become symptomatic. We would also know where the virus is prevalent uh, in our community if we had widespread testing. There are one of the failures of this um, of our government at this point at every level um, is that we do not have enough test kits 
and we have been asking for them and I am hopeful that soon we will get some to at least test those individuals who are extremely vulnerable like our homeless population. If we were able to test all of those individuals, that would go a long way towards pinpointing where we need to put our intervention efforts. So if somebody uh, is symptomatic or is concerned that they might uh, be infected with COVID-19, what should they do right now? The first thing I tell individuals to do is to call their primary care physician. Now, I know that that um, is where everyone is doing telehealth, but call your primary care physician, let them know what your, the symptoms are, and then your primary care physician can refer you to a test site. It is important because usually when individuals show up at the ED or the emergency room or a test site, they are not getting tested. So speak with your primary care physician first. The other thing is if you are having symptoms, feeling sick, stay home. And that's very important. We know individuals who really feel as though we, you have to work. And I understand that, we all understand that. But if you're sick, stay home, call your primary care physician and follow the advice of the practitioner. Now, if somebody doesn't have a, a primary care physician, uh, who can they call? If an individual does not have a primary care physician, then I can certainly give a number to one of our health centers um, that they can use for telehealth and uh, call over the telephone and get the information. Nobody, uh, for the most part, physicians are not having individuals come into their offices for the obvious reason, concerned about uh, contracting the virus and also wanting to keep people healthy. So telehealth is available. And so I will be happy to give the number of my office. And if individuals want to call, I can certainly give a number where someone will answer the phone and you can describe the symptoms and get some advice. We would uh, welcome you, Commissioner, to share that number now, but I will also uh, put it in the resource guide, and I'm sure it's also on the city's website. But if you'd like to share that number now for folks that might be listening, this is the number uh, for the health department, and it is the number that individuals should call if they are symptomatic but do not have access to a primary care provider. That's correct. And so that number is area code 413. 787-6741. That will get you to the main number at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and if any individual is uncomfortable with the advice that uh, they are receiving over the telephone from anyone, they certainly can call me directly. I'll be happy to uh, take that call and do what I can to facilitate uh, that individual getting uh, in touch with a primary care provider, or at least a provider that can answer some questions for them. So that number is 787-6741 uh, for correct. folks that are interested. Commissioner, just a couple of more questions um, that we had submitted and that we've heard from the community. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, the lack of available testing. Um, I, I had a specific question that was submitted about um, availability of antibody testing to see who may have already had the uh, the virus and gotten over it. Have we heard anything from the state or federal government about the antibody testing and if at any point that may become available? I think it'll become available at some point. It is not right now. I believe at uh, all levels, at the federal level, they are continuing to work on the process of isolating the antibodies and testing those individuals who may have antibodies. There are many clinical trials going on, as you know, right now. Some clinical trials are to try and get a vaccine so that we'll have a vaccine in place, hopefully within the next year. The other is antibody testing, to be able to test those individuals who may have had the virus and have built up antibodies so that uh, we can help other individuals who might become uh, infected in the future. But right now, to my understanding, most of that is in the trial stages. Thank you so much. Commissioner, I know you mentioned the most vulnerable uh, population, especially the homeless, and we know uh, from early numbers that uh, seniors are, are considered a vulnerable population. Um, we also know, though, uh, from your briefings that younger individuals now uh, are, are showing many risk factors as well and the need for, for young people to take uh, the stay-at-home orders seriously, uh, which we certainly support. Um, can we talk about those three groups quickly, 
um, and just say a relative a first to the homeless population. I know that the uh, HHS and the administration has taken steps to establish a triage area for individuals who are homeless who may need support relative to the COVID-19 outbreak. Can you talk a little bit about that site and um, what's available there? So that site is a site that um, has uh, three uh, facilities. I hesitate to call them tents. They are extremely well structured. Um, they have um, uh, toilets, they have showers, they have HVAC systems, they have heat, they have running water. And so the, those facilities or those structures are there. One is for testing. We don't have any test kits uh, right now, but when we do, testing will be done there. The other tent is for persons under investigation, PUI, which means individuals who may have symptoms but um, have not gotten a positive test. So that is a structure for those individuals. And then the final one is for individuals who may have, who are tested positive, who are COVID positive. It is a place for those individuals to, um, to uh, be so that they can be treated and that our medical staff can work with those individuals and make sure uh, they have everything that they need. Now, if they get uh, symptoms, then they will, or if they're not well, certainly we would transport those individuals to the hospital. AMR does a 11 to 7 shift at the facilities, at those structures, and so we have an ambulance that is on site to make sure that we have transportation available should that be needed. They're also on site as EMTs to take um, vital signs and anything else we may ask them to do. And Commissioner, I, I know that relative to the senior population, and we'll hear a little bit more later too from the food bank about access to uh, different services, but I know your department has been working hard to contact seniors. Um, can you talk a little bit about those efforts and you know, if an individual is a senior or has a senior family member that they're worried about, uh, who they might be able to call to talk about uh, some services for them? So the senior population, the staff at the Department of Elder Affairs is doing an excellent job on a daily basis. Uh, they are doing wellness checks on the individuals who are seniors in the city. They have done 3,000, uh, over 3,000 now, individual telephone calls. Uh, that is individual and cumulative is about 7,000 calls that they've made. Also, Greater Springfield Senior Services is doing um, checks on seniors as well. We have at the Department of Elder Affairs also established a process where we're getting out some meals to those individuals who have asked and who feel as though they need that support uh, from the department. And the, you, you make a good point about Greater Springfield Senior Services. I know that uh, Greater Springfield Senior Services just expanded their call center hours as well, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and their number is on our website. Uh, if you go to our jesseforspringfield.com and click on COVID-19, uh, you can get the number for Greater Springfield Senior Services and, of course, can also contact Springfield Elder Affairs uh, through 311, I'm sure, uh, to be able to uh, express any concerns you might have. Commissioner, um, the last question before we open it up for you, if you have anything else you'd like to say, if individuals um, are seeing large gatherings or non-essential businesses that are open or other unsafe behavior uh, during this time, who should they call and what are we doing to make sure that uh, the you know uh, orders that have been issued by the governor uh, are being enforced so um, the department it has a the environmental health team are in their cars every day going around and checking to make sure that non-essential um, businesses are not working it's difficult i have to tell you that uh, to span out over the city and to constantly try to make sure people are adhering to these very important guidelines has been difficult for the staff. Um, as far as individuals, but they are doing it. They are doing their best to make sure that uh, it, people are adhering to the guidelines. It's just very, very important um, that we help individuals understand they should not be gathering more than 10 individuals. You know that we've taken down the basketball hoops. We've closed some parks. We've done what, some things that were very difficult because young people want to be out and about and having a good time. And, but this is a serious virus. And so when we see individuals that are 10 or more gathered, it's a gentle um, kind of asking 
can you not, do you understand? It's not trying to be punitive. And sometimes we get a good response and people are fine with it. Other times we get a little uh, pushback. It's a very difficult, difficult guideline to enforce. Well, thank you for all that you're doing, Commissioner. Uh, we know you have a lot of work still to do tonight and your updates are greatly appreciated. We also know uh, your updates at the mayor's uh, Monday uh, conferences are appreciated as are the entire administration's efforts. I know that the city council, uh, you're on with us regularly uh, answering our questions and, and we really appreciate all the work you're doing. Is there anything else that you would like to share uh, with the folks that might be watching or might watch in the future about what they need to be doing and how they can stay safe and support uh, your efforts and your department's efforts? Um, it's important to me as an individual who was born and raised in the city and who have watched many changes uh, over that individuals with chronic diseases, underlying conditions such as heart disease, um, asthma, um, diabetes, if you have an underlying condition, even as a young person, please understand that it's important that you adhere to the things that we've asked you to do. And what are those things? Uh, we're asking individuals to stay home as difficult as it is. We're asking individuals to wash their hands constantly, to wear a face covering if they go out in public, to make sure that they are taking care of, of themselves. This virus is very, very serious. We're watching the death count go up across the nation. I'm watching the numbers in the city of Springfield for COVID positive go up. So I really hope that individuals adhere to this advice, not trying to be punitive, just trying to make sure we all get through this together and that everybody is healthy. Thank you very much, Counselor, once again. Remember, health is mental, spiritual, um, and emotional. And I, we can talk about another subject another time, which is the mental and emotional health of individuals who are struggling right now just to stay sane while they have cabin fever, want to get out. What are the things that they can do in order to secure their mental and emotional health as well? But for another day, again, thank you, Counselor, for hosting. Commissioner, thank you. And uh, one thing I'll say as we make our transition to our next individual uh, is, you know, one of the things we've spoken about is the seriousness of young people taking the order seriously. And, uh, you know, as uh, the youngest member of the city council, as uh, the youngest individual elected uh, in recent history in the city, you know, I'd like to echo that message as well. Um, because I think not only do we know uh, that as young people, we are also at risk, but also even if you are in a position of high immunity or high immune system, if you're an individual who may be able to survive the virus, we also have to be cognizant of the individuals we might pass it to, uh, that being uh, our parents, our grandparents, uh, other senior citizens in the community. And so we need everybody, including young people, to step up uh, with regard to keeping our city safe. Absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. And the commissioner, uh, we uh, will now move to our next individual and we will take a brief uh, two or three second break to switch interpreters. Okay, uh, we will now move to our next guest. Our next guest is the Executive Director of the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts, Jessica Collins. Jessica, thank you so much for being on with us today. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you being here. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts is and what your goals are? Sure, so the Public Health Institute of Western Mass is based in the great city of Springfield and we do research and evaluation. Uh, we build coalitions um, and we do health policy development. And right now, much of our focus obviously is on COVID-19 and how we can use those services um, to really lift up the voice from Western Mass uh, for resources and for messaging and for, um, for data. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what those initiatives now that you are working on look like around COVID-19 and, and also, you know, what is the data telling us? Um, 
Well, one of the advocacy pieces that we've been working on with many others this past week has been, or past couple of weeks, has been um, advocating at the state level to have the types of data that the commissioner was just sharing, the numbers and cases, to be able to have more um, demographic data around that. Um, so race, ethnicity, language, disability, occupation, um, and then specific zip codes so that each town um, and our region, each county and our region, and then up to the state can have specific demographic data in order to understand who is being Im impacted and what might be specific resources that we should be advocating for, for specific populations. Um, so that is one, um, one action step that we have been taking and our would like to say that the Western Mass delegation, the legislators have been very supportive of that. So hopefully that will um, come to fruition. I think it will. Um, we also have been building a online community resource database that we wanted to bring to the attention uh, of everyone tonight, which is called uh, 413 Cares. And you can find, you can look that up, uh, www. Uh, 413cares.org. This is an online community resource database for the Western Mass region. Uh, it's uh, providing residents the ability to access critical information and resources and services that they might need um, now and in the future, including resources and information on housing, food and nutrition, healthcare, transportation, early education, and more, those types of uh, just basic needs for folks. Um, the new site is expected to serve individuals and families impacted by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also just um, also basic needs for any time period. Um, and the 413 Cares portal helps individuals like each of us. Um, it also can help service providers and case managers and nurses and physicians and family members if you're looking out for a loved one. Um, organizations where individuals receive services can look up and make referrals across organizations and sectors, for example, to medical providers. So we really would um, love for people to know about this resource, this online resource database and look at it and share it with others. We are working hard with our community-based organizations in the region to keep the resources and contact information and information updated daily. This is an important thing where you can't uh, let information uh, become old, especially now where information is so important. Um, and then uh, also I wanted to amplify a couple of things that the commissioner said regarding uh, primary care and the telehealth um, uh, mechanisms that are happening now at primary care sites, so at health centers specifically in Springfield and across our region. Um, reaching out to your primary care physician, and if you don't have one now, you have a number that you can call at the city, but really is the best way to go. And the health centers now have both uh, staffing in the health centers for very specific urgent needs, but they also have staffing that is responding and checking in on people daily from their home through the phone. Um, care teams are made up of doctors, nurses, caseworkers, community health workers, behavioral health specialists. The commissioner mentioned that at the end of her, of her um, talk, the behavioral health element of COVID-19 is so very important. And folks should know that there, the behavioral health agencies in our community have very much ramped up their telehealth um, abilities. So supporting people through the telephone, if you can do a video from your home, they have that uh, mechanism to support people. So this is very important for people to understand that, that that is available to them and they can reach out and have a conversation with someone on the phone right now. The capability has been very much lifted up. I do want to acknowledge um, that we understand that there has been some there is a barrier for some people with regard to using phones and running out of minutes 
And this is really a critical time where people's ability to do things virtually and through technology couldn't be more important. And I know specifically that the care teams at our local health centers are aware of this and they're trying to create solutions to support people trying to get free minutes for their cell phone um, etc. So I also wanted to encourage people that are out there listening that, that if they know about creative solutions or if they have ideas right now um, for solutions with regard to that particular barrier to please share them. Uh, the other thing I wanted to amplify what the commissioner said with regard to just practicing the basic symptoms um, and the basic prevention strategies, excuse me, prevention strategies, is that we are encouraging people to stay home. We also understand that staying home for some people might not be the safest place for them, and that there are hotlines available. Um, there's uh, both the YWCA hotline, but also the National Domestic Violence Helpline, and also a chat capacity through www.thehotline.org. So it's one thing for us in public health to be asking people to practice prevention strategies, but I think we also have to acknowledge that there are sometimes tremendous barriers for some people um, that make the prevention strategies, um, if not difficult, potentially dangerous. Um, I also will add one more thing around, uh, and Commissioner touched on it a little bit, and so did you, but I just want to repeat again that it's important to dispel myths and really understand what are the best messages for people to be listening to and reading. And I think that the Commissioner's website, like she said, and I know your website has COVID-19 information. Our website at www.publichealthwm.org has updated information in that regard. This week, we're finding out more that the state wants people to wear masks when and if they have to go out. I think that's obviously very important, but for people that don't have masks necessarily in their home or have the ability to go out and find masks, it's important for people to understand what are some mechanisms that they can create masks at home um, just for a simple basic covering um, until they can get the validated um, masks that will hopefully become more available very soon. And so I encourage people to go to reliable um, either telephone numbers or listen to the Monday confer um, press conference or seek out websites that they know and trust. Jessica, what are some of the myths that you think are sort of out there uh, that we should be dispelling for the public? Well, I think there's been some confusion around the number of people that you can be with. So for example, the commissioner just said the number 10, which I think is very important. And I think at one period of time, the messaging was you can go up to 25. And so I think that staying in tune with the most up-to-date information, people, um, the experts are really suggesting don't get in groups of more than 10 people. Keep it small. Keep it in your intimate circle of either family or friends that you've already been interacting with. So that's, I think, one. Um, I think the other myth is around, um, you know, people not understanding maybe the proper use of masks or gloves or when you need them. I think the other big myth right now is around the use of particular medication that has not been tested through truly scientific rigor. And so spending energy and time and resources trying to get medication you know, which really has not been um, validated by true experts, I think is another big myth. Jessica, you mentioned uh, for individuals uh, where staying home may not actually be uh, the safest place for them um, and some of the resources that are out there. Uh, can you say again where to access those resources? Yes. So we have on, and you can look on our, our website as well, but I'll say slowly, the YWCA hotline at 413-733-7100 is a local hotline, or there's the National Domestic Violence Helpline, which is 
799-7233. Or there's a website where people can do a chat, which is www.thehotline.org. And again, we can get these immediately to you, um, Jesse, so that you can get them up on your website if you don't have them already. We will certainly do that and, and try to spread that. So if you're an individual uh, who is experiencing issues with domestic violence at home, there is help out there at the numbers and, and websites that Jessica mentioned, and we'll get that out on our pages as well. If you're somebody who might be worried about an individual who you know, uh, you know, would encourage folks to reach out, contact those individuals in a safe uh, way, and be able to share that information with them. Jessica, is there anything else that you'd like to share about the work that the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts is doing right now, or anything else you'd like to share with the public? Um, well, just that in one of one of our roles is to tr you know to try to bring people in different sectors together so that we're not siloed in our work and specifically in our efforts to address COVID-19. So I'm thrilled that Andrew Morehouse is here to talk about the work that the food bank is doing. We know from health center data and from just what we're observing, what people are looking for on the 413 CARES website, that food is absolutely critical at this point. The commissioner said that as well, um, that her Department of Elder Affairs is addressing that. So I think um, that it's important to bring people together to understand what is going on and being provided so that we're not replicating in ways that aren't helpful, but we're adding to and complementing efforts that could be a lot more helpful. And, um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to, to bring people together to understand how to augment the best strategies. Jessica, thank you so much uh, for the work that you and all the staff at the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts are doing. I know that uh, I've had the great opportunity to work with you and many of your staff around our work with public health and the environment. So we know uh, how hard you work and what an asset you are uh, to the city of Springfield. Thank you for being with us on the live panel tonight. Thank you so much for having me and for your leadership. All right, we are going to take a, a brief 30 second uh, break again to allow us to switch interpreters. And then we will move on to our next panelist. Uh, the next panelist will be attorney, uh, attorney Claudia Quintero. Uh, from the Central West Justice Center. So bear with us briefly as we switch interpreters one time. All right, and I've just gotten the all clear again. Attorney Quintero, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what the Central West Justice Center and community legal aid uh, do for the community and what your mission is? Sure. Thank you so much for having us um, be a part of the town hall meeting, um, council council member. Um, well, like you said, my name is Claudia Quintero. I'm an attorney with Central West Justice Center and Community Legal Aid. Community Legal Aid is our um, legal services organization located in Central and Western Mass. We provide uh, legal advocacy to constituents um, in Worcester County, Hamden County, Hampshire County, Franklin County, and Berkshire County. Um, and we have offices in all of the various counties. Um, we are two, basically the same organization under Central West Justice Center. We house our immigration work um, and we house a lot of our benefits work and then community legal aid. We do a lot of, um, a lot of uh, family work, housing work, et cetera. And in our organization, we have specific um, projects that we support. And one of those um, is an elder, elder unit uh, where members of the community who are over 60 years old would be eligible to be assisted with legal services. And so, our legal advocacy and our legal support is available to members of the community who are income eligible. So we do a lot of um, uh, screening to make sure that the folks who are getting our services are income eligible. That would include um, certain criteria we would look at, but if they're eligible, then we would assist them free of charge. And so our advocacy includes advice and counsel and um, extends all the way to representation of a client um, to the end of a matter. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that overview. I know that we're getting a lot of questions uh, relative to unemployment, access to benefits, and a lot of the, the other pieces that are coming down from the state and federal government, how to interpret those. I'm curious what types of requests for support that you guys uh, have seen a spike in at Community Legal Aid and Central West Justice Center since the onset of the pandemic. Um, yeah, we have seen pretty much the same too. We've seen a big tick in um, people asking if they're eligible for unemployment um, and several things coming up in the workplace where people have a lot of questions about different, um, different permutations of scenarios in the workplace for those who are essential workers and for those who have been laid off as a result of um, the governor's orders, et cetera. A lot of what we do in regard to the unemployment, um, we've taken on a big, a bigger role where we have opened up our unemployment unit to anybody who really has any questions to provide a level of advocacy and support um, that is simple as answering a question about whether somebody would be eligible for unemployment. Usually our advocacy is, has been limited before um, COVID-19 to um, appeal work. So when somebody gets denied unemployment benefits, we get involved in ap appealing that decision to try and overturn that decision so that the person could be eligible for unemployment benefits. Um, right now, our, our advocacy has been opened up. So we are helping people, informing them on where to apply for unemployment, uh, whether or not we think they would be eligible and if they should, and sort of informing them on the differences between the federal unemployment um, law that came down as a result of the CARES Act and all of these different um, matters that have sort of nuanced the issue. Um, so we've been definitely addressing those concerns for community members. Uh, we work a lot with community partners and we've been answering questions for them and of course um, taking in more intakes of applicants who have questions about their eligibility for unemployment and then questions relating to their employment for those who are still working. So attorney, if an individual has been laid off as a result of the pandemic or had their hours reduced, you know, what does the process look like right now and what steps should they be taking? Sure. If an individual has been laid off as a result of COVID-19, if their hours have been um, cut or if they've been ordered to quarantine by a medical professional, our advice to folks is to definitely apply for unemployment. Um, there are certain um, restrictions student requirements that have been waived. For instance, um, the Department of Unemployment Assistance has a requirement that for anybody to receive unemployment, they'd have to wait a week. Uh, that one week wait period has been waived. So if somebody applies as soon as their claim is processed and they're determined to be eligible, um, they would start receiving um, unemployment benefits. Uh, the other thing is to keep in mind the new CARES Act did issue a paid an emergency paid sick leave uh, provision for folks who are um, would apply for unemployment. They cannot apply for unemployment and receive paid sick leave at the same time. So folks should know that if they do choose to, if they're not laid off, if they're just taking you know time off, if they've been quarantined and they want to use the paid sick leave, they could not also apply for unemployment benefits. Can you talk a little bit about uh, with regards to the CARES Act? I know that there were some extensions of benefits uh, included in the CARES Act, allowing states to extend benefits uh, to individuals who might not have otherwise uh, been eligible previously. I know we've gotten a lot of questions, especially about uh, self-employed individuals. Um, can you talk about what the status of that is here in Massachusetts and what those individuals can expect? Yes. So the um the CARES Act um, expanded who would be eligible for unemployment. This includes self-employed workers, gig workers, independent contractors, workers who have not worked long enough to have that base wage um, that would make them eligible, workers who are only seeking part-time work um, or who've been ex excluded from eligibility for working with certain types of employers, and then anybody who hasn't used up their state benefits after July of 2019. 
So what DUA, the Department of Empl Unemployment Assistance, is doing is they are, are reviewing applications of people who have applied for unemployment benefits before the CARES Act went into effect, as, and they're doing a look back up until February of this year to see if anybody who was denied unemployment benefits then would now be eligible as a result of the CARES Act. And I know that the, the governor's office had come out with an announcement, um, especially for uh, self-employed individuals relative to the application process. I know they can't, is it true that they can't apply right now through the traditional unemployment office, but they're working on some sort of portal to allow those individuals to apply? Correct. Um, and, and it should be noted that for un the unemployment, just in general for anybody who is applying, um, the online application process is by far probably the most preferred method and the easiest method to apply for unemployment. Um, the, the hotlines and the phone numbers and the callback forms we've found as advocates that they don't really work or they're not really as effective in getting people to apply or get a callback. We know that the unemployment office is overwhelmed and so they've asked people to apply online the the problem um is that the the online application is only in english and, and um it cannot be accessed on a smartphone or a tablet it has to be accessed on a computer and so it does provide um difficulties for people who have limited english proficiencies um but if there are community partners in the in the area or in the community who are willing to step up and help people apply who might not be able to do so themselves for a lack of, of of language accessibility or other issues um we would definitely encourage people to do so and then for folks who can't find anybody they can always try and reach out to our office um as that's something we would help people with as well and i believe i did see an announcement uh relative to the language access um out of the the state government earlier this week so we'll we'll check into that and be able to put it out on our our uh information streams as well, um, but I did not know that it couldn't be accessed uh, via smartphone or tablet. And for many of our constituents, that is how they access the internet. So we'll certainly be reaching out uh, to the state regarding that. And I know my colleague, uh, Councilor Orlando Ramos, had actually written a letter earlier in the um, pandemic time uh, urging the state to expand the hours and the uh, weekend hours of the unemployment office, which they did uh, do to try to address the backlog. How long? Do you think right now it's it's taking individuals from application to receiving unemployment? Um, honestly, I I can't really answer that question. I'm not really sure. The reality is that we see folks when they're not eligible, when they're not able to get through, or they haven't received benefits, and so um, we don't hear about the you know the good things when people apply and they get benefits a week later. We don't we don't really have our ear on the ground on that um, statistic. But from what I've known, most people who've applied um, and haven't gotten through or haven't heard back, I would say people are pretty, unfortunately, pretty, um, pretty um, in dire need that they, they, they reach out to us pretty quickly if they haven't heard back in, in a week or, or, or so. Attorney, what if an individual is laid off and they had employer-provided health insurance? How, I, I'm sure it might vary from individual to individual and policy to policy, but in general, how will that individual, what steps should they take to make sure that they remain insured and to insure their family? We do know that um, the state has extended the enrollment period for Mass Health. They did reopen the enrollment period until, uh, I believe it was April 25th um, for people to to apply for Mass Health if they were let go and they didn't have uh, insurance um, on their own outside of their employer. Um, people, depending on their employer's policies, could also, if they had the resources or the ability to do so, could bind to the COBRA um, policies that employers sometimes do offer. But we do know that anybody who is unemployed or has been let go and no longer has access to health insurance, um, we would definitely encourage them to apply for Mass Health as soon as possible. An attorney, um, for help with uh, those types of applications or guidance around unemployment, could you share uh, the number and website for your organization? 
Yes, our organization's email address, and it's it's probably easiest if people can apply online, uh, but I will give both. Our website is communitylegal.org, and our phone numbers are, if you'll just give me a minute here. Uh, we have toll-free numbers that people can call into. It's 855-252-5342. Attorney, thank you so much. And those numbers are also on our website. If you go to jesseforspringfield.com and click on COVID-19, uh, we actually, Community Legal Aid was one of the first organizations to reach out when I started putting our resource list together. Uh, to make your information available. So we appreciate you for being here and for all that you and your colleagues are doing. Is there anything else that you'd like to share uh, with uh, those who might be uh, listening at home or also anything that you think we in the, in the local government should be doing? Uh, yes, I would say that we are definitely open for business and we're here to provide as much information to folks as, as they need. And so if anybody has a problem or a question, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, if community members or community partners have questions or um, concerns to also reach out to us, we do. Uh, we have a lot of advocates who do a lot of work across a lot of different practice areas and are very knowledgeable. And I'm sure if anybody had a question, we could find somebody to address the issue. Um, we are working very hard at informing both our immigrant community and our um, homeless population and our benefits people and everybody who is severely affected by COVID-19. And so we're trying to be as accessible to the community as possible. So thank you so much for putting this together and keeping us in mind. Thank you very much, attorney. Uh, we are going to move on to our next guest. We are going to take a brief uh, three to four second uh, break to switch interpreters and then we will get rolling with our next guest on the panel. All right, and our next guest is going to be the Director of Economic Development for the City of Springfield, Mr. Tim Sheehan. We are glad to have Tim on the call and on the panel with us today. If you're just tuning in, whether you are live on Facebook, if you're on HYN or Focus Springfield, I'm City Councilor Jesse Letterman. We're live with a panel of local officials and community organization experts talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the local response and resources that are available. Director Sheehan, thanks for being with us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, Councilor. It's great to be with you. My name is Tim Sheehan. I'm the Economic Development Director for the City of Springfield. Tim, tell us a little bit about, you know, what the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the local economy has been and what, you know, the city of Springfield is doing uh, to respond to that. In short, I would say it's been devastating. Um, we're dealing with a public health emergency that is pretty much unprecedented in well over a century, both in terms of its scale and the uncertainty of its duration. Um, uncertainty within businesses is one of the worst things. Um, the crisis has negatively impacted almost every industry sector and every business in those sectors, uh, with the exception of maybe food, medication, and essential supplies, and of course, Amazon. Tim, uh, with that in mind, what types of relief uh, is available to businesses uh, from the city of Springfield? And then we'll talk about the federal government after that. But from the city of Springfield uh, specifically, I know we've done some grant programs and we have another round out now. Can you talk about uh, what relief is available and how businesses can uh, apply to access that? So our first round, um, first of all, we, we've been uh, advancing funding out of the Community Development Block Grant Program that the city administers. Um, our first round was uh, for restaurants uh, because they were the first industry sector that was hit, hit by the emergency public health orders. Uh, we had approximately $225,000 to deal with. Um, and using that funding, uh, we advanced uh, 30 applications to award out of 80 applicants that totaled over a million dollars worth of requests. Um, and the grants were up to $15,000. 
Uh, my understanding uh, uh, as of today is that is the first and largest grant commitment that was made available by a municipality in Massachusetts. Um, but it certainly uh, cannot address the full scale of the need for assistance that's out there. Uh, uh, additionally, uh, 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 right now we're advancing a small business fund round. Um, that is for approximately $500,000. Uh, applications are due back into the Economic Development Office uh, this coming Thursday. We're anticipating that uh, we'll also be fully oversubscribed for that uh, funding resource as well. Um, and um, uh, uh, we would encourage folks that uh, have a need to definitely apply. If they have questions about the application that's online on the city's website, uh, under the economic development uh, webpage um, uh, to please give us a call. It's 413-787-6020. Uh, we're happy to provide whatever technical assistance we can offer to uh, folks that are looking to apply. Um, we do have a very quick turnaround time for these because the need is out there right now. Um, and we are processing the applications uh, that we have gotten in uh, for scoring and contracting as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, we basically have all but, uh, uh, I think, uh, six or eight of the uh, applications in the restaurant round uh, still not advanced into contract, but the, the vast majority have been advanced uh, into the contracting process, and checks should be going out uh, relatively soon to those uh, uh, award, awarded uh, restaurants. So Tim, the, the next round, the 500,000 uh, that is gonna be dispersed, that application is available now, but it is due back Tuesday, correct? It's due back Thursday. Due back Thursday, thank yes, so due back Thursday. And, and that's up to how much money uh, per application? It's up to $15,000. And if someone did not get awarded uh, the full 15,000 in the uh, restaurant round, they can apply for the difference in that up to the full 15. And what uh, can that money be used for? Uh, under the restaurant program, uh, we really tied it to uh, payroll uh, for a specific reason, because we were trying to encourage restaurants to move from uh, uh, what was typically a full service model uh, with table service to takeout and uh, ultimately retain some employees. Uh, in the small business round, it's much more flexible in terms of the utilization of the resource. Uh, but uh, for rent, uh, for inventory, uh, for debt service, um, uh, but at the end of the day, they have to evidence back to us that they have retained a low and moderate income position. Uh, Tim, we had a question specifically submitted, and for folks that might just be joining us, these questions that we're asking are questions that were either submitted specifically to the town hall, questions that I've received um, from constituents uh, in my capacity as a counselor, and also based off of briefings that I've participated in with uh, department heads uh, with information that we know will be valuable to the community. This was specifically a submitted question, which was about uh, the availability of uh, access to these types of grant funds for nonprofit organizations that may employ individuals and have their, uh, their business or their uh, ability to operate impacted. Um, are they eligible to apply under this city program um, or are, do they have to seek other avenues? Unfortunately, they're not eligible under this particular round. And unfortunately, it's an issue in terms of the CDBG structure. Uh, we're currently dealing with this fiscal year's CDBG allocation and nonprofits ultimately come under the public services uh, component of the CDBG program. It's capped at 15%, and we have allocated the full 15%. Um, but in terms of the CARES money that, that is coming through CDBG and also looking in, into future, the upcoming year for CDBG, we certainly recognize that the nonprofit community is a big employer uh, in the city of Springfield and recognize that they have needs as well. And we would be looking to provide programming in that regard as well. Uh, so, Tim, speaking of the CARES Act and the federal government, I know that the CARES Act included in, in a large amount of, uh, of information uh, and authorizations relative to support for, for small businesses and businesses of different sizes. Um, 
what do we know at the municipal level about those supports that are available and where can individuals go for guidance uh, to navigate that process? Well, it, if the business has the ability, uh, they have been using both their uh, legal representation and their account, accountants for guidance. Um, if they don't have that, uh, we've been uh, hearing from businesses that have been engaged with small business advocacy groups, uh, as well as uh, trying to deal directly with the SBA, albeit that that's become much more cumbersome uh, given the, the overwhelming volume that they're dealing with. Um, and there are businesses that are calling us directly to find out, you know, how we can help them plug in to, to get what resources uh, they're eligible for. And is that a service that uh, the Department of Economic Development is able to provide? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have contacts with SBA. Um, we've been having conversations with SBA about um, uh, uh, folks that have contacted them and trying to find out and facilitate their applications through the process. So what is the uh, number or website uh, that individuals should go to or contact if they're looking for support uh, from the Department of Economic Development for that type of process? They can certainly go to the city's website and then click on the economic development uh, component of that website and it'll take them to our page. It has all our contact information and again, you know, we're happy to uh, provide whatever resources we can to assist businesses in that process. And Tim, what's the number for uh, your office? 413-787-6020. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, Director Sheehan, thank you so much for being with us. Is there anything else that you would like to share uh, either with those watching, with members of the business community, uh, or uh, anything that you think that we need to be lobbying the state and federal government with regard to the economic recovery? Um, thank you, Councillor. I think uh, our collective community health is the primary focus at this point. Um, our return to uh, business and economic engagement uh, really needs to be done with the science and the, the data behind it um, and those behind those decisions. Uh, and I, I just leave you with the, you know, our watchword in dealing with that, uh, uh, the impacts of the virus really needs to be patience because that's all that's gonna get us through all this. Director Sheehan, thank you for all that you're doing and for being with us tonight. Same to you, Counselor. All right, we will be now moving uh, to our final three panelists. We appreciate everybody for sticking with us through this town hall. We're sharing, we know, a great deal of information. And I wanna remind folks that a lot of this information is available on the city's website, springfield-ma.gov. It's also available on my website, jesseforspringfield.com. And we'll be sharing uh, this uh, video that has been recorded, uh, the entire program today will be available later on the Focus Springfield website as well as on my website. So there will be uh, an opportunity for folks to review this in the future as well. Uh, we're gonna take a brief uh, few second break to switch interpreters and then we will move forward with our next guest who will be Andrew Morehouse, Executive Director of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. All right, our next guest is Andrew Morehouse, Executive Director of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. Mr. Morehouse, thank you for joining us, and would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you for the invitation, Councilor Letterman. <clears throat> yes, my name, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Andrew Morehouse. I'm the Executive Director of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. Uh, we're based out of Hatfield, which is about 30 minutes north of uh, this great city of Springfield, uh, right up uh, Interstate 91. Uh, and that being the case, uh, we serve as the leading provider of emergency food to more than 175 local food pantries, meal sites, shelters, and some of our own direct uh, food distribution programs across all four counties of Western Massachusetts, including Hamden County, Hampshire County to the north, Franklin County, 
farther to the north and Berkshire County all the, all the way to the west. And uh, Mr. Morehouse, with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, how has this impacted food security in Springfield and Western Massachusetts? Sure, uh, we've uh, looked at the data uh, for the month of March uh, and compared it to the same month the previous year, 2019, and we've seen a 23% increase in uh, food distribution. Uh, and we know that uh, with the unemployment claims skyrocketing, uh, we expect that food insecurity, uh, which means you know, not knowing where your next meal is gonna come from, uh, is going to spike even more. Uh, just in the last week of March, there were 148,000 unemployment claims across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's compared to the, the average prior to that, which is, was about 4,000. Uh, so that just goes to show uh, that uh, you know, we've seen a tremendous skyrocketing in un unemployment claims. So we expect unemployment to increase dramatically. And our role is to provide food assistance to whomever uh, is in need of it. Uh, regardless of your circumstances. So if you're an individual who has availed themselves of food assistance in the past, we're here for you. But if it's the first time that you're in need of food assistance, we want you to know that uh, all of our partners and, and our own direct distribution of food assistance is provided with uh, compassion and uh, respect uh, and dignity uh, for our, uh, our patrons. Uh, and so it's, it's a service for everyone. And Andrew, can you talk a little bit about what that service looks like, what services are available in Springfield and where people can go to get help? Absolutely. Um, we have uh, 40 partners, uh, or I should say food distribution sites in the city of Springfield. Uh, just by way of context, uh, last year, well, we provided food to 23,000 people in the city of Springfield. Uh, and that we provided the equivalent of 3 million meals uh, to those individuals over the course of the of a 12 month period. We do that, as I said, through 40 different food distribution sites. Of those, uh, 17 are, are food pantries where you can get a bag of groceries. Uh, five are meal sites where you can get a, a hot meal. 11 are what we call our mobile food bank, and that's a direct distribution of food from the food bank on our trucks at, again, uh, 11 sites throughout the city, uh, pretty much uh, scattered across the entire city. Uh, and that's a, a location where you can go to a, one of our hosts uh, that has a large parking lot. We, uh, do, we send the truck there, and with a group of volunteers, we unload the truck and then make uh, food available, primarily produce uh, and uh, uh, frozen meats and dairy products available to individuals who come to that site. They, these 11 sites usually provide food from anywhere from uh, 150 to uh, 250, 300 people at a time in, in about 45 minutes. Uh, it's open to anyone. And then lastly, we uh, provide food to uh, seven uh, senior centers in the city of Springfield uh, through a program we call the Brown Bag for Elders. Uh, uh, elders sign up for this program for the, during the course of the year and receive uh, a bag of groceries once a month at a senior center that's uh, close to them. So we make food, this food available. Uh, much of our food comes from uh, the federal government or the uh, state government. About half of our inventory, in fact, comes from those two sources. And the other 50% or so of our inventory comes from the private food industry, local retailers like Big Y and Stop and Shop, uh, other supermarkets, uh, and then from our local farmers uh, and, and beyond. And Andrew, are all of those sites uh, currently still operational in the city of Springfield? That's a great question. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're very fortunate that there are only there's only one meal site that uh, is temporarily closed. That's the Holy Redeemer uh, Cathedral site. Uh, we have five of our brown bag sites at senior centers are closed because all of the uh, 
uh, city-owned senior centers uh, were mandated to close. Uh, two brown bag sites remain open. Uh, one is an in Indian orchard and the other is the brown bag site uh, administered by uh, the um, Springfield Urban League. And uh, in terms of pantries, there's only one pantry closed at the moment. Oh, I said that already. Um, and three of our, excuse me, yeah, three of our mobile food banks, uh, actually four, no, three of our mobile food banks are current temporarily closed as well. And this is all due to concern for public safety. Uh, the mobile food bank sites and the brown bag sites at the senior centers were closed at the, at the request of those hosts uh, as they determined it's safe for their staff and volunteers to uh, open them again. We have instituted certain uh, procedures, included social distancing and uh, uh, all our volunteers wear gloves and uh, wash their hands and wear masks. Uh, and uh, in so doing, we're able to make that food available. So we, we hope to get those back online. But as I said, uh, there are 11 of the sites uh, at, in Springfield, uh, three of which are closed. So that means eight are, are still open throughout the city. And Andrew, where can um, folks go to get information on when these distributions are and uh, also what phone number could they call? Sure. The uh, best location to find a listing of all of the sites that are open in the city of Springfield and across the four county region for that matter is on our website. Uh, our address is foodbankwma.org and uh, click on the get help uh, tab or just on the COVID-19 uh, icon on the home page and you'll be directed to our uh, list of uh, pantries and meal sites and, and other food distribution locations. Our telephone number is area code 413-247-9738. You will get a voicemail message. We have staff uh, working remotely. Uh, you can just follow the prompts uh, and uh, leave a message and someone will uh, return your call. That's why we encourage people to go to our website first. And if somebody um, goes to one of these distribution sites, is there uh, a specific identification required or any type of documents that they need to bring with them or are they able to go and receive uh, support uh, without that sort of thing? Another great question. Uh, if you're an elder and you want to go to a brown bag site, you do have to be registered. So we encourage you, uh, if you are income eligible and there are income eligibility guidelines uh, to, uh, contact us or your local council on aging who will connect you with us uh, and we can begin the enrollment process. If you're going to a mobile food bank, there's absolutely no uh, requirement. Uh, we just ask a couple of simple questions. Uh, uh, we wanna know how many elders are in the household, how many children are in the household, and if you've been to the site before. And then the, uh, the local feeding programs, pantries and meal sites all have their own requirements. Uh, none of them, again, are going to ask you for specific documentation uh, unless they're making food available from the federal government, in which case they, there is an income eligibility threshold of 250% of poverty. But uh, in all cases, uh, pantries and meal sites have a wide assortment of food. So if you're uh, ineligible for that uh, federal food, uh, you will certainly be uh, uh, able to access uh, food from uh, other sources, including um, uh, you know, very healthy food, uh, fresh produce, uh, dairy products, frozen meats, uh, dry goods, uh, and, and even uh, high uh, nutrient dense uh, canned good items, uh, um, that are high in protein and, and the like. Andrew, um, how can individuals who might not be in need but want to support uh, the work that the food bank is doing, how can they uh, support food security in the city of Springfield and, and step forward in that role? I appreciate the question. Again, the best thing to do would be to go to our website, foodbankwma.org, and you could uh, click on the Get Involved page. Uh, and, and learn how you can get involved. There are many, many ways from 
uh, volunteering to engaging in advocacy to uh, advocate for public policy that will level the playing field for everyone in our community so that everyone has access to healthy and, and affordable food. Uh, we do provide a lot of um, SNAP application assistance. Uh, we often need volunteers to support our team of uh, four full-time staff who are assisting people with the SNAP application process. Uh, there are also opportunities to volunteer either up at our warehouse or at local pantries and meal sites in the city of Springfield. We can connect you with them. Uh, and lastly, just educating yourself about the issue of hunger and food insecurity. We have lots of information on our website and you know, we wanna really normalize uh, this situation now that uh, you know, is affecting so many people that it, there's, there's no stigma, there should be no stigma associated with seeking food assistance. Unfortunately, there is in this society. And we hope that uh, in this crisis, uh, when so many more people are facing uncertainty whether it's economic or otherwise, that they know that uh, the community is there for them and that there is uh, healthy food available uh, if they should need it uh, because you know, their, their paycheck uh, or their unemployment check or their SNAP benefits are, are not available. Um, we're here to help. Andrew, thank you so much for all the work that uh, your staff and volunteers and partners at the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts are doing, and for you uh, spending a couple of hours here tonight with us to share this information with the community. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share uh, with those watching at home uh, or uh, with me about what you think local, state, and federal governments should be doing right now? Well, I, yeah, I appreciate the question. Uh, first, I'd just like to emphasize that, you know, the, the folks who come seeking food assistance are, you know, our neighbors, uh, members of our congregations, they're our fellow employees, they're uh, you know, just about anybody. Uh, and in fact, 23% of the individuals we provide food to are children, and another 21% are elders. These are the most vulnerable members of our community they also include people with disabilities, including veterans and, and working families trying to make a living on a, on a minimum wage or underemployed people. And now, unfortunately, we're gonna see more and more people who are unemployed, uh, who have never been in need of food assistance uh, in seeking out that assistance. And, and again, we're here for them. Uh, and in terms of what the state and federal government can do. We're, we're, we're fortunate that we will be expecting uh, a large uh, uh, allotment of additional food uh, from the federal government. It won't be coming till about July. So until then, we have to figure out how we're gonna get more food out. Uh, we do have uh, a request out to the state legislature and the governor's office for more food assistance. Um, anyone and everyone can, um, particularly in, in city government, can. Uh, uh, echo that uh, a request uh, and, and underscore how important it is for our residents in the city of Springfield and across uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, and, and we're very thankful for all of our public officials, both municipal and, and uh, our Western Mass state legislative delegation, which has always gone to bat for us uh, on, on issues regarding food insecurity. Uh, we're very grateful. So thank you for having me tonight. Andrew, thank you so much, and again, to your staff and volunteers. And our uh, next panelist uh, will be, these are our final two panelists. One thing I'm learning uh, is usually our in-person town halls end up going a little over time, and apparently that also extends to the virtual realm. So we appreciate folks uh, for sticking with us. I do wanna let our panelists know that if you have already um, you know, done your piece, you are welcome to stay on the call with us or follow along, but if you've already spoken um, and you would like to uh, remove yourself from the Zoom call, you certainly are welcome to do that. Um, but our next panelist uh, will be my great friend and uh, colleague, School Committee Woman Latonia Monroe Naylor. And uh, we're glad to have School Committee Woman Naylor with us. I had called her uh, earlier on in the evening to get some clarification around certain school department policies mm -hmm. and uh, we both agreed it would be better for her uh, to be able to come on here and you could hear uh, straight from our school committee woman, Latonia 
Monroe Naylor. Madam School Committee woman, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate it. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So I did get your email with all the questions, but I didn't send it to the email that I am having access to right now. So, uh, but I do have it in my head. So if you don't mind, um, what I'll do is give you an overview uh, based on what we talked about earlier. And if I miss out on anything, feel free to chime in and, and ask me for some clarifying questions. Does that make Sounds sense? Good. Take it okay, So um, I'm really, I have to say that I'm very humbled and I'm really, um, I'm really proud of the work that Springfield Public Schools is doing here in the district as far as what it is that we need to do to take care of our families. Um, I'm a member of the Mass Association of School Committees and I can tell you that a lot of districts are still trying to figure out how are they feeding their children, how are they getting resources to their children. So we just had, and actually are in the, the tail end of it now, we've passed out almost 10,000, if not over 10,000 laptops to students. So we've had a one-to-one -one policy uh, for any students above th uh, third grade now for some time, I would say almost two years, but um, we didn't have a policy where they all took them home. So they had them while they were in school, but not all of them had access to their laptops outside of school. So we had to make it an effort to make sure that all families had access to those laptops outside of school. And we were able to get a partnership with Comcast to make sure that families have access to uh, internet at home for the next two months uh, complimentary. Um, and so there are hotspots across the city. If anyone is having issues still with um, getting access to internet, we're asking you to contact the schools. Don't bring the laptops back and leave them at the schools. Just contact the schools, wait for somebody to get back to you if you're having issues with getting on internet so that they can make sure you have the most accurate information as to how to get access to internet. However, uh, teachers are doing Zoom calls, they're doing online learning, they're doing, um, the iReady, they're doing a lot of different things with our students, and, and I'm really happy to see that they're still staying engaged with them. Um, a lot of people ask questions around the third quarter grade. So what we did is we cut off the grades as of March 12th. And so whatever the students did up to March 12th would have been counted as their final grade, uh, with the exception of students that might have been failing. So no student got a failing grade. Students um, may or may not have had the opportunity to make up the work because maybe they had access to uh, computer or technology and, and maybe they didn't, but they were not able to fail any students. So no students should have failed. And then for this last marking period, uh, we're looking at having a credit, no credit option specifically for the high school students um, that are graduating because we did not want it to be a situation where students couldn't graduate because of a GPA issue or something like that. And so i um, really excited to see that we are doing that. Um, some people may have uh, found out at this point, but MCAS, um, is, they've issued a waiver from our commissioner. Um, commissioner Riley was very smart about it, and I'm really happy that he has the experience of being in schools and being a principal and a superintendent, understanding what that feels like. Uh, so his compassion <laughs> was definitely uh, felt amongst the districts when he said that they would waive um, waive that. And so, as you know, if students don't pass the MCAS, they don't get to graduate with a diploma. This year, any students that did not yet get the MCAS uh, passed and have still would have had the opportunity to take another test to pass are still going to get the competency and still receive a diploma. So we're really happy that that's going to happen. As far as graduation, it's still up in the air because we don't know if schools are going to go back into session. Uh, but we are planning to, to do something. We don't know what that something is yet, uh, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to have a traditional graduation at some point. And if not uh, traditional, then I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do something to make the students feel like they had their rite of passage and now are moving on to the next stage of their life. Um, for many folks that are not, you know, listening to what uh, Andrew was just saying about food insecurity, that is a huge issue. So people who are not aware if you go to the SPS website, springfieldpublicschools.com, follow us on social media as well, then what you'll find out is that uh, there are several mill sites across the, uh, the city. And we're steadily adding sites and we're steadily adding mill options. And so right now we have Monday through Sunday, we have meals for kids, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we just added snacks. And what that means is that families are able to have food throughout the week for their children. 
what they do is they come Monday through Friday to the meal sites um, that are listed on the website. They are able to grab what they need. It's literally drop off, so there's no contact. And then on Fridays, they're able to take food for the weekends. And so students are able to eat over the weekend. And then Monday, you start all over again. Families do not need to bring their children to the sites. Um, they can leave their kids at home and go pick up food for their families. Um, if you have a student who is special needs or a child that's over 18 and they're concerned and they're hungry, get food for them. It's don't, they're not going to card you and wonder, you know, are you 18 and a half or 21 and a half or whatever. Whoever comes to pick up food for their kids, they will get food. They will not be turned away. And so we want people to know um, we've given out over 200,000 meals as of last week, and that number continue to, continues to grow. And, and like I said, I'm really happy that we're doing this even through school vacation, which is scheduled. April vacation is scheduled for next week. We will still have meals being served to students during that week. So we want families to know even though the, the teachers need a break, they've been working intensely trying to make these things happen for our students and, and they are a little um, deserving of a, of a vacation. So uh, they will be having their vacation as scheduled, but our students will, will still receive food uh, during the week. And so um, some last things just to know, and, and if I missed anything, Jesse, I'll, I'll have you chime in in a second. Um, stay updated on what school committee is do, doing. Um, we do have virtual meetings as well, uh, just like city council, so people can still chime in and listen into what we're doing. Also, we have our budget hearing, it's budget season. So people who are concerned about the budgets and want to know, you know, what are we doing? How are things gonna move forward for next year? Please attend our budget hearings. We will have opportunities for folks to ask questions as we normally do when they're in person. And so we're encouraging that. And so did I, is, did I miss anything that people had questions about? <laughs> Uh, Madam Committee Woman, uh, as usual, you did not miss a beat, and we appreciate you for being here. I think the only thing, you may have actually said it, but I just want to uh, reiterate, just in case you did not, uh, which is the uh, reopening date. Uh, we know yeah. that we have heard, uh, I believe, May 4th is what is set right now. Yes. I know many people are wondering um, if that date will be moved back, and if it is moved back, is there a chance that people will not come back? at all until the next term. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question. So May 4th is currently the date that we were told by the governor that schools have to remain closed until. I've already heard that some districts are planning to go beyond that without governor uh, mandate. However, we haven't made the decision yet officially. I can tell you just from looking from the outside, inside out, that I don't foresee that we'll be going back to school May 4th, but that's Latonia looking at it and seeing what the circumstances are. It could change. Um, we, if we go into maybe mid-May, then I could see us still coming back physically if they allow us to come back. But once you get close to June, it's almost like, what's the point at that point? So I would say to, I would say to folks to stay tuned, listen in, check in with school committee, check with the um, social media for SPS and check the websites regularly. And I know the information will continue to be there. As far as the Parent Information Center, if someone asked that question, um, it is still open, um, but it's, it's tricky. Um, there's a lot of things that normally folks would have to go in the, in the office for where they would have to see people one-on-one -on -one that is now being done online. And so we always had an online registration process, but now more so than ever, it's being utilized. And we're directing folks to that online registration so that we can have as minimal contact with folks as possible. So if a family does have a need, they can call down there by all means, but we are really trying to discourage folks from showing up there because you may not be able to um, enter into the building. So try to call. If, if necessary, I don't know if they're taking appointments at this point, um, but there was some talks about it. I've heard some, some rumblings about that, but I do know that online registration is happening as well. So folks will be in contact with you through that way. Committee woman, last question. If a parent uh, has concerns about uh, anything or is just looking for information, um, who can they call or email? They can send me an email by all means, latonia 4 at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-N-I-A, -A, the number four, schools <laughs> at gmail.com. Or my SPS email is nailerl at springfieldpublicschools.com. And if I can throw in a little commercial for Parent Villages, Jesse. Of course. Of course. Um, we're working on an, an initiative called Village Engagement Matters. Uh, show up for your community. 
and we are working with several partners and churches to do um, face coverings for families and residents who need them, and we're giving them, giving them away at no cost. And so the first distribution is gonna be at Dunbar on April 24th, along with the food that they're distributing. They will have these packages to give away to folks. And um, again, we're doing no contact. We have volunteers that are sewing things for us and all of that, but everything is no contact. We're following social distancing requirements. Uh, but we have people who have provided funding and um, donated materials for us to do these coverings. And so we look forward to on that day providing at least 400 face coverings for folks and we will continue to do so. So anyone who wants to volunteer or knows of people who want something to do at home and they want to help out with folks, um, please contact us at parentvillages.org or, or look for us on social media. Uh, we'd be more than happy to take that anyone up on the offer to assist us. And we will have a, a lunch meetup. We've been doing our virtual meetups. The last one we had 52 people in attendance. Um, this month we have another that's gonna be the last Saturday of the month at noon. Uh, it'd be virtually and we'll have the link available online as well. Committee woman, thank you as always for your service to our constituents and the parents and students and teachers of uh, Springfield Public Schools. I know that we are all grateful, especially to our teachers and administrators right now. Uh, we know that while school might not be in session, they are certainly still working to support all of our students. And we know that uh, the school committee is behind them on that. So thank Absolutely. you uh, for being with us today. Thank you for having me and continue to stay safe and healthy, everyone out there. And like I said, if you have any questions, reach out to me or reach out to Jesse, you know, outside of counselor, let him in. <laughs> and he knows how to get in touch with me. Thank you, counselor. All right, my friends, and we will move now to our final panelists for the evening. Uh, we do apologize for being a little over time, uh, but we have a lot of information to share with the community tonight. Our last panelist is a good friend of mine, Rose Webster Smith, the lead organizer at Springfield No One Leaves. Rose, thank you for joining us for the panel and hanging in there. Can you tell us a little bit about Springfield No One Leaves and, and the work that you do in the community? Sure. Um, thanks for inviting me, Jesse. Um, so Springfield No One Leaves is a grassroots member-led community organization that was born out of the economic crash of 2008. So we organize tenants who are living in foreclosed homes, homeowners that are facing foreclosure or fighting for their home post foreclosure, and tenants facing bad living conditions, rent increases, and displacements from the communities that they help build. And Rose, um, tell us a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted housing security in Springfield and in Massachusetts. Yeah, so many people are feeling really, really insecure right now when it comes to their housing situations. Many people weren't able to pay rent uh, or their mortgages on April 1st. And we know that many, many more are not going to be able to make that rent payment or that, may, or that mortgage payment on May 1st. Um, notices to vacate, otherwise known as a notice to quit, which is the start of the eviction process, are still being um, passed out to um, private tenants. Um, those are tenants that are protected under the Federal CARES Act, which we'll get you know into that a little bit more later. Um, and there's been 602 summonses and complaints to housing court that have been filed since March 16th. Um, through yesterday um, across the state here in Massachusetts. Um, so with these summonses coming out, people are very confused. The court saying that, you know, they're not open till April 21st. So people show up to court not realizing that that court date's been postponed. Um, and it, there, there's no way for people to be uh, in communication unless um, they're calling us or they know that, that that's actually um, not the court date and that the court will reach out to them with a new court date. And Rose, you, so you mentioned um, obviously that we're already seeing an impact on housing security as a result. Uh, we know that you know we have had a, a large amount of individuals who have been laid off or had their hours reduced, and we heard earlier, we know that uh, while unemployment has been expanded, not all of those uh, benefits are yet actually in place to be distributed, and there's certainly a backlog of folks who uh, are, are waiting to get the benefits. So that certainly means that for many folks who might be living paycheck to paycheck, that they, they might have trouble 
making a rent or mortgage payment at this time. I'm sure that uh, that's the, the situation of many constituents right now. Um, I know that uh, there are some protections that are in place or protections that have been announced, uh, whether it's by the governor or by the uh, federal government legislation. Uh, I, I imagine that that is uh, really dependent upon you know, where you're living, who holds your mortgage, what type of housing you're living in. Can you talk a little bit about what are the protections that, that are in place right now or have been announced? And then maybe we can talk about what needs to be done further. Sure. Um, so any, te any tenant that has Section 8 lives in project-based housing, public housing, HUD-subsidized senior housing, and other HUD-subsidized housing, USDA subsidized housing or any tenant whose landlord has a federally backed mortgage, which is HUD, FHA, USDA, VA, otherwise known as Veteran Affairs, um, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac are protected from non-payment evictions right now underneath the Federal CARES Act. Um, you can utilize your local, for those tenants um, that are trying to figure out what type of mortgages their landlords have, you can utilize the Registry of Deeds website um, to find out if your landlord has a, a HUD or FHA, USDA, or VA loan. Um, it's a lot harder to find out if your landlord has a mortgage that's backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. You can try to see if there's an assignment of mortgage um, for either of those entities in the Registry of Deeds, but those are not always filed. Because in Massachusetts, somebody can hold your note and another person can hold your mortgage. So you might think that US Bank, um, you know, is the one that owns, you know, you're paying to, but in reality, you know, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac is the one that is actually holding the note to your loan. Um, so there, there's ways that you can go, for tenants it's hard because you can go to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac look up um, to, to search the loan, but you have to know your landlord's last four digits of the social, social security number. Um, so it's, it's really hard to be able to tell whether or not your landlord has a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac mortgage. But if you're a homeowner, you can find that out by going to that, that website? Yeah, so if you just Google Fannie Mae lookup or Freddie Mac lookup, um, the very first thing that pops up on Google is their, you know, freddiemac.com slash loan lookup. Uh, you put in your address and the last four digits of your social security number, and you can find out if you have a Freddie Mac. Um, and then you go to Fannie Mae lookup, which is knowyouroptions.com slash loan lookup. Um, and that's Fannie Mae's lookup. So you would do the same thing and put your address and the last four digits of your social security number. And, and they may it. be the backer for your mortgage, even if that's not who you write your check to every month. Exactly. So if you're a homeowner or a landlord that's been impacted financially, and you should, they should reach out to their servicer in, in that case? They should reach out to their servicer, um, and if they, they have problems with their servicer, they absolutely have the right, if they find out that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac is in the back, um, to reach out directly to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, if they're not getting anywhere with the person who's servicing their loan. And what type of relief through that federal act is available? So if I, for example, if you're a homeowner or a landlord and you reach out uh, because you're not able to make your payment, what, what can you request? So you can either request a, a deferment or a forbearance. Um, we advise people to request a deferment because a deferment means they're deferring the, whatever mispayments you have to the back end of your loan and you're considered current on your mortgage. Where forbearance, um, they, there's two ways they can handle it. You can go six months without paying your mortgage, say, and then they can require a lump sum payment or what they can do is um, a six month forbearance. And then when you start paying your mortgage payment, you know, you have to pay your mortgage payment plus an amount on top of it that's decided whether that's 200, 300 more every month until um, you're caught up on your arrears. And the problem with forbearance is if you miss a forbearance payment, um, you're already technically in default. Um, so it's very easy for them to um, 
start moving you into the foreclosure process. Um, and we're still recovering here in Springfield from the 2008 crash. The foreclosures haven't really slowed down out here. So we definitely don't want to see our home, our homeowners or small landlords um, losing their homes to foreclosure. So it's very important to know the difference between deferment and forbearance. Now, Rose, if you are a, an individual who's a homeowner or a landlord, or you're the tenant of a landlord, uh, and they uh, uh, are not, their mortgage is not backed uh, through one of those entities, what boat are you in now? And what per, do you know what percentage of mortgages are, are, are covered by that protection? So it's somewhere around 60% of mortgages across the country are covered under that, and then about 40% aren't. Um, if you're in the 40%, what protections exist for you as a homeowner? So there really are no protections yet, um, which we have been working very closely with the, um, the Senate and the House of Representatives. The House wrote a very good bill. We worked with the Senate. They wrote a very good bill um, on the eviction and foreclosure mor moratorium. Unfortunately, they weren't able to concur with the bill, so it is in a conference committee. Um, and we're pushing really hard for them to, to get something out to protect these tenants so that they're not feeling like they need to be out um, trying to find a job during this public health crisis or that, you know, homeowners are not out there trying to get jobs um, so that they can pay their mortgage because they're not protected. So we're, we're really pushing them hard to get that bill out and, and concurred and on the governor's desk so that he can sign it. And I know that uh, myself and 10 other city councilors did uh, early on, as I mentioned, uh, write uh, a letter urging that type of action by the state uh, legislature. And I think one of the important things that you mentioned that people don't always think about is we do, especially in Springfield, uh, have a number of uh, smaller landlords who might own a few properties. And if, if their tenants are impacted, uh, then their ability to also pay the mortgage on those properties is impacted. And so what really needs to happen is there has to be an all-encompassing legislative solution um, in order to keep, I think, that the housing market and the housing stock in Springfield stable. Um, right. Because we don't want to see, uh, you know, individuals being evicted or properties being foreclosed, which will eventually lead to eviction anyways. Uh, so we, we want to make sure that, that folks are staying in their home during this time what can individuals who need help, who want to understand more about what you talked about, who can they call uh, to get that support and guidance? So there, there are, first I want to say there are some monies available. So even though the, the RAFT offices are closed, um, you can still apply for RAFT online. So more money, I think it was $5 million, was put into the RAFT program. The RAF program is not only for tenants, but it, you know, last year in July of 2019, um, they also implemented a program for low-income homeowners. So if you find yourself in that situation, now is the time to, to, to do your best to try and get an application into RAF. Um, which, you know, here, what, what RAF is, can you share? So RAF is, is the um, program that's run Wayfinders is the is the local administration here, and it's run by DHCD. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure what RAFT actually stands for um, at this moment in time. I have been up since four this morning, and and you know working on the legislature. And I do want to say, like, yes, we're pushing for the eviction foreclosure moratorium, but we're trying to do this in phases, right? We want everyone to feel comfortable to stay in their homes and shelter in place. There is a phase two, which we will be, um, you know, the bill is already written um, and that we're, you know, fine tuning it um, that will help with uh, other programs to pay people's back rent and for mortgages. And I do wanna say that the eviction um, bill that came out of this Senate does include small businesses. Like we're not forgetting the fact that small businesses are, you know, absolutely impacted by this. And we don't want to see them evicted from their um, place where they operate their business um, because they had to shut down due to the health crisis. 
So ultimately what you're saying is that even if the eviction and, more, uh, eviction and foreclosure moratorium is passed statewide, uh, there is follow-up legislation that ensures that landlords are made whole uh, and that uh, you know, and everybody eventually is paid uh, and, and therefore the, the cyclical economy can continue. Exactly. So, you know, if we, we can find ways to get people's rents paid, right, that money that they're trying to save up, right, can be put into the economy to boost the economy back up. So there, there's, a, there's a whole fa three stage um, phase that we're, we're trying to work through as all the housing um, groups across the state of Massachusetts are working as a coalition along with our legal services, Community Legal Aid, Heisler, Feldman, and McCormick, Harvard Legal, legal Bureau, uh, Greater Boston Legal Services. Um, we're all working together um, to make sure that all of these things are put into place so that everybody remains home, whole and everybody remains protected. And so, and I just looked it up. So RAFT is Residential Assistance for Families in Transition. Uh, that is the funding that low-income homeowners and tenants can apply for if you're having trouble making uh, that mortgage or rent payment. Certainly, we want to get that information out there. Rose, last question. Um, first, what can individuals do to support that legislation? And finally, can people reach out uh, to your organization for help? Yes, they can absolutely reach out to our organization. Um, you can call us at 413-342-1804. Uh, again, please leave a message. We're dealing with a high volume of calls and a lot of Zoom meetings with legislators to get this passed. Follow us on Facebook. Start calling your, your state reps and your state senators. Let them know that you want these bills put in place and that you, you, you want them to move the legislation so that you can feel safe to, to stay at home and follow these orders um, instead of going out and, and like some landlords have told their tenants, well, we're not getting any relief, so go out and look for a job. Like Lowe's is hiring. Home Depot is hiring, and we don't want people to do that. We need people to stay at home so that they that we can, you know, slow this curve down and protect people um, and keep them safe. Rose, thank you so much for all the work that you and the members and organizers at Springfield No One Leaves are doing, and we'll be sure to get that information out to everybody who watched today and also on all of our various pages. Well, thank you for having me, Jesse. All right. Well, my friends, uh, this brings us to the conclusion of our panel. As we conclude tonight, uh, tonight's virtual town hall, I want to thank uh, everybody who took time uh, to come and speak uh, with us about the local response to COVID-19, about the community resources that are available and the support that's out there in this community. When we talk about uh, getting through this pandemic together, this is exactly uh, the type of camaraderie that we need in order to ensure uh, that everybody is made whole, that our families stay safe and healthy, and that we come out the other side of this as an even stronger community. Given uh, what has been said tonight by our many panelists, I have no doubt uh, that folks are stepping up into that role. And we want to continue to hear uh, from members of the public about what you're going through. As we mentioned, tonight's questions came from questions that were submitted uh, ahead of the town hall via our website, as well as questions I've received in my capacity as city councilor. Um, but we are going to continue to be available to respond to those questions, to connect you with community resources. And I wanna say again, thank you to Focus Springfield uh, Community TV for all their work in helping us to make this a success. Uh, as we come uh, to the conclusion of tonight's event, I will close just as I open. Uh, let me start by saying that we remain available to provide constituent services. If you are in need or you want to talk about anything you heard on this town hall, feel free to reach me directly. My cell phone number is 413-285-3041, and my email is jletterman at springfieldcityhall.com. As I said at the beginning of tonight's event, uh, while our methods of communication and action may have changed, our commitment to advocacy and service has not. And uh, it remains an honor and privilege to serve the city of Springfield. And through our collective efforts, I know we will get through this together. It is in that spirit that I wish you good health and safety to you and your families. We thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have a good rest of your night.